Yeah. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Wednesday Voices. Halloween edition. <laughs> Nailed it. Done. Hard because sharks don't have feet. So. <laughs> hey folks, welcome to Wednesday Voices. Last week we talked about the Lord's Prayer, and in the Lord's Prayer we state the words, um, Your kingdom come. But what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Um, Oscar Romero states, A church that does not provoke any crisis, preach a gospel that does not unsettle, Proclaim a word of God that does not get under anyone's skin or a word of God that does not touch the real sin of society in which it is being proclaimed. What kind of gospel is that? The kingdom of God is one of the phrases that we use all the time in church. And it's one of the ones that nobody really knows what it means. It's obscure and kind of old language but I think what I, what I try to hear when I hear those words is what it will look like when the reality of God's presence and God being in charge of all things really and completely and totally shows up and changes people's lives and makes things better and heals the world, and brings justice. So it's two words, God's kingdom, that communicate all kinds of uh, things that God has been yearning for creation to experience for an incredibly long time. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, God's kingdom is going to show up, even if we don't pray that. But when we do it, it helps remind us and orient us and help us experience the first fruits of God's presence here right now in our midst. The first sermon Jesus preaches, he describes himself to the crowds in worship as God's kingdom embodied and invites everyone else to embody this work too. Jesus is always inviting us to be allies and accomplices, invested in this work of revealing more of what God desires here and now, not just later on in the afterlife. So Jesus says, I have come to bring good news to the poor and to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to help those who cannot or will not see have new sight and to proclaim that God's favor and blessing is for the unexpected and for everyone, here and now. The thing about the gospel is it's risky because it's always moving things around. It's moving people around. It's comforting those who have been in pain and giving them a reason to be hopeful about what could still be possible. And it's also afflicting those who have been comfortable have been seated in power and don't want things to change. The gospel pushes those of us who have privilege to think bigger and to take action for the sake of our neighbors. So one of my favorite songs, kind of of all time, is a song called A Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. And I love it because it embodies exactly what Meta was just talking about. There's this sense of undaunted hope, of pervasive hope that you hear in, in Sam's voice, in his vocals, in his lyrics, as he is struggling with all of the things that are unjust, all of the pain that he has experienced in his life. And um, yet there's this yearning and, and, and picture and vision of how things someday will be. And me, when I, when I hear that song, it makes me uncomfortable. 
Because I know that there are many, many thousands upon millions of people like Sam who have had those experiences because of people like me. There have been people who have had those experiences because of me. And so the song invites me to have a different vision and, and to work for God's kingdom to be made real in people's lives. So we're going to include a link to that song. I encourage you to listen to it, um, spend some time with it, and, and talk about what it does to you. What do you hear in that song? As a Christian and as somebody who works in a church, I often find myself in conversations about the difference between being partisan and political. Being partisan means that you're endorsing a certain kind of candidate or telling people exactly who to vote for and putting the weight of the church and the theology behind a human being saying this is what God ordains and desires for leadership. We're not supposed to do that in the church, and I'm really glad that we don't. But being political is different. Being political is part of living out the gospel. It means the needs of the people, the public, are taken into account when it comes to our spiritual lives, the way we worship and serve and gather together and pray. And of course that makes sense because the gospel, the kingdom embodied in Jesus, cares deeply about people, not only their spiritual needs, but also their emotional and mental, vocational and physical needs. Maybe it's tempting to think of church as a place we can escape the political or step away and take a respite from what's happening in the real world. But when we do that, it is a sign of our privilege and the power we hold in a system if it stays the same, a system that God is pushing on, um, that God is inviting us to reimagine and challenge all the time. Sometimes I think we have and live like there are a bunch of little boxes in our life. We have a school box, a church box, a work box, a family box, and we like to keep them separate. But what this part of the prayer invites us to consider is that all of our life is mixed up and, and um, comes together to help us be the people that God intends us to be. So if you think that your faith doesn't have anything to say with who you are at school or how you live out in the world, pay attention to that because God's kingdom exerts power and influence and an invitation on all aspects of our life. Our dear friend Drew Stever wrote a prayer about this. So join me. Saints and sinners, we are always both. May we as a people and as a church Remember that we are constantly evolving. We continue to try and become better versions of ourselves. That we see injustice in our wor world and emphatically shout it out of existence. Transphobia, violence, racism, anti-Semitism do not belong in this church. Oppression and abuse do not belong in the kingdom of God. We will mess up. We will mess up without doing any intentional harm. May we, may we mess up without doing any intentional harm. May we mess up knowing that the grace of God is still given to us. May we mess up knowing that we are still welcome at God's table. Here I stand, proclaimed Martin Luther. Here I stand. I can't not love this church. I can't not want the best for it. I can't not compassionately critique it when there are better ways to be. I can't not love and serve this body of people, the body of Christ. 501 years of the Lutheran Church, and we're still wondering, learning, grappling with how to do this. I hope that we never figure it out. As soon as we do, we become comfortable, complacent. Let us always be uncomfortable and motivated to learn to love more.